Shout out to Nick's parents. They're somewhere around. Are they the back of the room? I didn't know they were coming. (laughs) And I've spoken to Nick's mum, and she has promised to wave her hand if she hears some exaggerating or telling lies. (laughs) So, look, everyone's familiar, Nick, I think, with your massive success story. But there are so many stories within the story. So I wondered if we could kind of go back to the beginning when you decided, you and your brother, to up sticks from New Zealand and head to China and start a toy company. How prepared were you when you landed there to go into business? Very unprepared. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a long story. It actually starts with my brother when he won the New Zealand uh, Science Fair. He was 12. Dad was chief scientist, chief engineer. And we used to make these kit set hot air balloons uh, as kids in the garage, take over the living room, as mum will say. And, um, and that led us to selling them door to door, selling them at the hot air balloon festival. And then Matt left university after a year. Um, I went to university. Um, and then sort of he set up a little factory in, in Hamilton, um, Mahana Road, um, before that on the, on the family farm. And then I didn't get into second year law. So Matt said, why don't we go to China and try and make our first product, which was the model hot air balloon. So we left. Um, um, I was 18 at the time, um, and Matt would have been, I guess, 21, 22. And yeah, we flew to, to China, not knowing anyone. We had kind of one contact from um, uh, that, we, that we had, and we got to Hong Kong airport, had very little money, so we, it's sort of a famous story. We slept in the bushes outside of Hong Kong airport that first <laughs> night. We were going to sleep inside, but the fluoro lights were too bright, and hotels were too expensive, and then we got attacked by mosquitoes, and then we... From there, we moved to a little place called Shanto. Um, there were no other Westerners there, so we were there for between Shanto and Guangzhou for about two years. I don't think we met another sort of Westerner. Um, so that was that was a, a fun time, um, and that was sort of the beginnings, I guess. So you really weren't afraid to rough it right from when you landed. I mean, that wasn't the half of it, right? You were sleeping in the factory. You were sleeping in the showroom. Yeah, we had we had um, our first factory was in a place called Function Dao Dao, and it was beside this little river in China, and it was basically a small tin shed. And my cousin Simon, who came over um, as well, he welded our first production line. I think we had about eight um, factory workers, and we had um, one cook because we had to cook for everyone. And she would cook um, outside. We had sort of two little holes in the grounds as the toilets for everyone, and she would cook right beside them on the ground with like a big wok. And we'd eat that same rice and vegetable meal like every day. So we lived on, literally, I think it was two RMB budgeted per meal, so about like 40 cents. And so we ate those meals for like quite a few years. Um, Get and quite I was, skinny. Yeah, I was saying like one of the funny things is we really, we really didn't spend anything. So the first two years, I remember celebrating Christmas at McDonald's with my brother. So even I think it was like two dollars fifty for a Big Mac combo equivalent. And I remember we went to McDonald's, and even that was sort of like a treat, right? And I was like, Merry Christmas, bro. I was like, Merry Christmas, and have like a Big Mac. And that was like a treat at the time. And I was so, we were so poor that I would pretend, I would eat half my chips, and then I would go back to the counter and pretend that they hadn't filled them in the first place, so they'd give me a free chips. And I ran that one over and over again whenever. Um, Thank you, McDonald's, for sponsoring yeah, Zuru's exactly. early days. <laughs> <laughs> But no, we really, like, we really lived pretty rough. Um, Matt, I think, still lived in the factory for 12 years, had a little room in our first factory. Um, obviously, we've built lots and lots of factories now. Um, still had a room in our head office in, in China. And uh, yeah, so for those however many years, we lived on, on very, very little. I remember when I first um, went down to Hong Kong, most of the toy industry globally revolves around showrooms. So we had this, um, well, actually, I was trying to email buyers. We had our first and second product. I was trying to email all these buyers from around the world, emailing Walmart and Target and all the biggest buyers, never getting a reply. And I'd always sit there day in, day out, emailing and calling. And one day, I managed to get, I think it was after like four months of trying, I managed to get Walmart on the phone, a guy by the name of Ryan Halford. And he finally picked up, and then I had no idea what to say. And he said to me, he goes, so do you have a showroom in Hong Kong? And of course we didn't. I didn't know what a showroom was. Um, I was probably 18 or 19. And I said to him, of course, on the phone, sure, sure, I'll send you the address. He said he's out in Hong Kong later. So the next day I was on a train to Hong Kong trying to, you know, find a showroom 
But of course we had no money, so I was going around existing toy companies, knocking on their doors, asking if I could borrow some of their space for an appointment with Walmart, and if I sold something, I'd pay them a commission. They all said, no, no, no. So then I eventually found this tiny little um, cubicle, probably five times, six times as big as this table in front of us. Um, and it was a lot of money at the time in Hong Kong. I think it was maybe like $3,000 a month to rent, which we didn't have. But I rented this, we had to, we had no choice. I had to give them a, a, an address. And so we rented this little sort of glass box showroom and I, I found a table that had been thrown away and I found some old shelves that someone else was throwing away and I put them in the showroom. And I had a mattress that I bought and I used to roll the mattress out under the table because there was nowhere else to put it. There was no other floor space. And I'd sleep under my showroom table and then I'd wash in the, in the public bathrooms um, each morning. Um, and there was one story actually when I had a buyer come early. She came at 9 a.m. I thought the appointment was at 10 a.m. And I was still asleep under the table. Um, and she was knocking on the door and I could see her feet kind of like below the door. So I had to stay like dead still, wait till she went, message her and say, hey, um, you didn't turn up for that 10 a.m. She was like, it was 9 a.m. I was like, ooh. <laughs> so lots of stories like this. What I found so interesting though, we were, I was grilling Nick before we got up on stage, was that you actually stayed living that frugally even when the business was starting to bring in serious money. Yeah, we did. We did. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, part of, I guess, we've grown, I think, I was looking before this year, the first six months, we've done about one and a half billion revenue, probably hit about three billion in revenue this year, um, or just under, around that three bill mark, but we've completely self-funded it. So from those first days, apart from the bank of mum and dad at the beginning, um, uh, which helped us sort of um, get going, but very, very, very little money to begin with. And in order to self-fund that level of revenue, we've had to be highly profitable, um, as well, so we've kind of built the business completely organically, no banks, sort of no outside Which financing. Which is phenomenal. I take it mum and dad got paid back. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> um, what you're describing, that level of tenacity and also that, that willingness to just bluff it if you don't know, then, <laughs> you know, find a way to make it happen. Is that innate to you? Is that something about your, the way you were brought up or is that just something you decided you were not going to take no for an answer? <laughs> I think if you're, like, really competitive, you don't want to lose. And so you just keep fighting and scrapping and finding a way. Also, like, having a really healthy dose of naivety. We were very, very naive. Um, I'll give you one example. Our second and third products that we made, um, one was called a night flyer, and it was a fiber optic uh, LED night frisbee, which we'd copied off a company called Night Eyes. And another was this, our third product was this money bank called a money gobbler, and it was kind of like in the shape of an animal, and you fed the coin through the mouth, down the throat, into the stomach, which was the money bank. We'd copied that also. And we had no idea what IP was or what patents were, any of this uh, like type of thing. We were very, very naive. And I went to New York Toy Show. I stayed in Big Apple Hostel in Times Square there. And I'd sold this product to um, a distributor called Schilling. And I had both products on their booth and I was sort of rearing to go to sell our products that morning. Within the first hour, we had a guy come screaming onto the booth and his whole business, Night Eyes, had been making these night frisbees for 10 years and they had five patents. He's screaming at our distributor to take them off the booth. So Dave said to me, Nick, you've got to take those down. So, oh, that's okay. I can still sell the money gobbler. But I, if I thought the first guy was crazy, about an hour later, this lady who had made a whole business over 20 years, these, these sort of money banks um, that were completely ripped off, um, she came screaming onto the booth and was far, far madder than the first guy. So my distributor, Dave, was like, Nick, what are you doing? Like, what are you, wh where have you copied these from? And I kind of had to go back to China, with my tails between my legs, and say to Matt, you know, have you heard of this whole, like, patent IP thing? I think we've breached a lot of it. And from that point on, we were in two lawsuits, and we had no money to defend ourselves. And so I remember going to um, the, the company Night Eyes was based out of um, Boulder, Colorado. So I went to Colorado trying to get a lawyer and every law firm was like, well, this is going to cost you a million dollars to defend, a million dollars. We had no money. So I eventually found this lawyer, his name was Chad. He got disbarred after our case. Um, Chad is such a name <laughs> for an American lawyer. But, uh, Chad. And he, he, I'd sold him this whole story of how we were going to win and if he could just put his name to, you know, all the pay, well, I'd do all the hard work and heavy lifting and he just sort of had to put his name to it and submit it all. So we did it really cheaply. Um, didn't work out so well for Chad. Um, and, and after three years, it didn't cost us much, but we ended up settling like both those cases. Um, but we were very, very, very naive like, um, to think back at how bad we were at what we did. 
So when you today. started coming up with your own toys rather than copied <laughs> ones, um, how many kind of duds did you pump out before you had your first... A lot. Rock star so success. we were we were so frugal that we were starting to make products, and I could hustle and sell enough of them to different retailers, but we never ever got a reorder, probably for six years, and so I'd sell enough of them that we were making money, but then the products were always failures, so we never got any reorders from the retailers, but we were still profitable. We could always sell enough to new retailers to to sort of remain profitable. We barely knew what a reorder was, so it took us probably a good six years, and. We started not actually making products. I started to distribute products from American companies internationally, and that kind of helped us build our like distribution network. And we got a couple of hits. We had ZBs, then a product from from the US, then a product called Schnooks, which became a big hit, and then Robofish about 12 years ago, which became our first major major hit. But it took us like a long time. We were really bad. Really bad. And what are the big hits these days, and, and how many of them are you pumping out? Yeah, quite a, quite a lot. Um, so we have right now in the US four of the top ten toys in the world, including the number one selling toy. So mini brands was actually an insight from New Zealand with Little Shop and New World, which most ah. people will be familiar with. And I thought that was a really great idea, and it hadn't been done really outside of New Zealand, um, strangely. And so we took that concept um, to the US, but in a toy format. It's now the number one selling toy in America. So we've shipped over one billion capsules in 24 months. Um, so it sells more volume than a, than a Hot Wheels car, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, you get insights from anywhere, really. And the bunch of balloons still going strong? Bunch of balloons, we produce, uh, I think, about 16 billion balloons a year. Um, so about, 100, about 16 million packs, um, a bunch of balloons. So that still remains seven years in a row, the number one selling summer toy in the world year on year. So both number one selling toy, all categories, and Bunch of Balloons is number one summer toy. And I think uh, last year, we topped six of the 17 toy categories in the US. So um, for MPD data, so official data, we had six, uh, six number ones in six categories. Wow. <laughs> we're going to talk about... So we got better. Yeah, It's the moral of the story. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about some of the other elements of Zuru shortly, because I'm fascinated, and I'm sure you guys will be too, at what else they're up to. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about what is it? What's the secret sauce? If you could replicate what it is that makes Suru so successful, is it you and your brother? <laughs> or is, it, is there something that you can identify, the kind of um, the DNA? Of yeah, the I think there's... I, I, I kind of look back over our journey, and I think there are lots of things that I pull out that are kind of core to our DNA that I think have made us successful. I think inherently you have to be an entrepreneurial person. You have to be really competitive. You have to really want to win and be driven to win, first and foremost. But then I think there are lots of things that I identify within our business that have really helped us continually go into categories and, and, and really, do, uh, you know, really perform. And one of our mantras is 2% improvement a week. It's how we can continuously improve in every part of our business. And so you can't measure 2% improvement a week, but it's more a cognitive function of how are we always improving and how are we always getting actionable insights and improving on those. So I always say you either win or you learn. You never lose, right? You either win or you learn. And so we kind of took a, almost a Steve, it's a Steve Jobs theory around um, what we call brains trust. And brains trust is basically a mechanism to make sure every part of our business is always improving. And so I always say to the team, we suck now compared to where we are in the future. So we want to be able to look back on today in a year and go, we weren't even good, right? Like we've improved that much in every area of our business. And so what Brains Trust does is Steve Jobs used to say that every Pixar film would start out and it was okay, but every four weeks he had his Brains Trust Lassinger, his head of like animation, his head of all the areas come in and judge every piece of work in that movie and try and improve it. And every four weeks... People would go away, teams would go away, they'd come back to Brains Trust and they would have improved on what they presented four weeks before. And they do that process over and over and over with like a regular cadence. And it meant that you could never flatline. And most businesses, most people, like inevitably flatline, right? So flatlining is the enemy. So through having a, a mechanic across every area of our business, um, uh, which we call Brains Trust, it means that we hold everyone accountable to constant improvement. And improvement compounds. So the power of compounding improvement is a really amazing thing. And so I always know that if we go into a category, we'll start off really naive, like when we went into pet food, we were really bad, and now we're becoming really good. 
But I know that if I constantly get actionable insights and we constantly learn and improve every single week, that eventually we will get there because that compounding will improve quickly. Is there a risk to kind of going out there in the world with a product that you might suck at at the beginning though? Can you do brand damage doing it that way? I think you have to have a thesis first on how you're going to win. So one of my favorite sayings was in Sun Tzu in The Art of War, and he says, the victorious strategist has won the fight before he enters the arena. The losing strategist fights first and looks for victory later. And what that means is you have to have a thesis from A to Z, not A to F. You have to think through everything A to Z and how you're going to win first. You don't always get it right. You get lots of things wrong. But you have to have a good, strong thesis on how you're going to win before you enter the arena. So I'd like to think that every area we go into, we have a really strong thesis and case, and we've thought through everything really in depth before we do it. And then sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. I guess there's some things you just can't foresee, right? So once you get into the arena, you have to adjust that strategy and the old kind of fail fast. I agree. And I think one of the great theories, and I, I had lunch, people in this room might know him, Jonathan Lau. Um, he was ex-CEO of Alibaba. Um, he has a house here in North Shore. And I, I, I asked him, um, you know, what was the secret to Alibaba's success? Alibaba's the what, ninth biggest company in the world by market cap. And he said, fast fail, fast fail. And so this ability to what I call fire bullets before cannonballs is really important, right? So it's not an investment that's going to cripple you, but you should always be experimenting and firing little tiny bullets to get actionable insights. And if those bullets work, then you fire a cannonball. And so within our business, we are always testing, iterating, testing, iterating, and testing in like different areas and different categories and working out whether we can win. And if it works, then we get behind it in a much bigger way. You've got thousands of employees now. How do you make sure that you've got the best people around you and that you're keeping them engaged with that constant 2% improvement? Sure. I think two things. One is meritocracy, so always align the business interests to the individual's interests. And then we have this, and it's part of our DNA, is this part around talent density. So it's harder to do in New Zealand because of the laws, but even if you get rid of an average or good person, the average of all your talent density goes up. So how can we look for the best people in the world at what they do? Um, and that's ultimately our goal. And then how um, um, you know, we say in our business, specialize and hyper-specialize. So we want people to be really specialized at what they do. And only the best become generalists. Um, because if you specialize, you become far more efficient. A great example is, I don't know, there's lots of examples actually. Um, but a great example is, say, Henry Ford, when he bought on the production line in 1907, it took about, before that, it took about 1,300 hours to build a car. After the production line and people specializing in doing small little aspects and becoming really good at it, the quality went up, but it took about an hour and a half to make a car. So the power of specialization and hyper-specialization um, is also really important. It sounds like you've spent a lot of time looking at other business leaders who've done it really well and taken little lessons from all of them to feed into your approach to business. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think we, yeah, we definitely do. Like, I would say my brother Matt looks at Elon Musk and how he implements speed of innovation. Mm. Um, I would say that, you know, I look at lots of just different business models and, like, study them and lots of people and then try and take our, you know, we always create our own DNA as well, but try and take parts of that DNA um, and implement it to our business um, as well. You talked about the meritocracy and the 2% improvement. Does that make it a really competitive place to work? Everyone's fighting to prove their worth at Zero? Yes. And I, I, <laughs> like, like McKinsey have a saying, up, and, up or out. So you're either after two years, you're in a position to move up, mm -hmm. or they work on a way to move you out. We're not that ruthless, because at the end of the day, you do need people doing certain jobs that, aren't as, um, that, that, that don't need that philosophy. But in our key areas, which we call our SAS teams, people need to be moving up or out. Um, and so that talent density piece is really, really important. But as, as a, a, you know, first of all, you have to, as a leader, like set the right frameworks and the right vision. And then we have brain trust to um, and ensure we're always improving in every area in our business. And that's like core to what we do. And then we really try and simplify and streamline our business as well. Because simplification, complexity naturally creeps in as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's how do you always put in guardrails and tighten things up um, consistently. And there's lots of great examples around the world of businesses that have been turned around just by really basic uh, streamlining. So one really quick example, Lego in the year 2000 was almost bankrupt. It's now the most valuable toy company in the world worth about 20 billion US dollars. 
the guy from McKinsey came in, he realized that 94% of their bricks were unprofitable because they were designing new bricks with new designers with R&D and engineering and tooling for every single product. He said, from today forward, 80% of our bricks will fit 100% of our products. 20% of the bricks will be used to make different products, and then we will incentivize our designers to use less bricks to make more new products. And he basically streamlined the business. He took it from 400 Pantones down to 20 Pantone colors, streamlined the production, streamlined sales, streamlined the SKU count, streamlined the amount of time going into design, and, made, and basically turned around to make every single brick profitable. So in a very short amount of time, with some very basic streamlining, he made the business far more successful. Are you coming for Lego? We are. <laughs> We're in a lawsuit with him. It's been four years. Oh. Um, so we are, yeah. Right, okay. Fair dues. <laughs> you're, you're not afraid of conflict? We don't like Lego. They don't like us. We're trying to invalidate their trademark. Right. It's like sellotape, so they really don't like us. Okay. I'd, I'd love to talk about some of the other elements. We like a bit of competition. It's yeah. good. You rally around the flag, right? It's good for the company. Yeah, I get the impression you're quite competitive. So, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about... Um, Zuru Edge. Sure. W what brought that about? ADHD. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to do something new. Uh, I, no, I was, I, was, I was quite sick um, about three and a half years ago. Um, and I had Crohn's. And I had to come home to have surgery, to have my bowel removed. And I was yeah, really unwell. But I was a little bit bored back here in New Zealand because I was living in Hong Kong and China. And I always had this thesis. And the thesis was that, well, I don't know, Taking a step back first, I was kind of looking at the world of consumer goods, and when you're in toys, we reinvent 80% of our whole product line every year. So you're moving really fast, and you're working in every material form, from electronics to plastic to plush to something, like everything at scale, and then that product line can be gone within a year. Yeah. And so I kept looking over towards consumer goods, thinking, wouldn't that be great just to make one nappy, and you could just keep selling it year after year after year <laughs> without just constantly being paranoid. And so that was my first thought process. Then I kind of looked into it a little deeper, and what I found is that there are so many duopolies and monopolies in global supply of consumer goods. So if you look at pet food, Mars and Nestle, 90% share globally. If you look at laundry, P&G has 90% monopoly globally. If you look at personal care, it's like Unilever and L'Oreal have a duopoly. And through those duopolies, they become quite lazy, both from an innovation standpoint, but also like what they deliver to their retail partners around the world. So I did a deeper dive, and I realized that retailers like Walmart that do $600 billion in revenue make far less profit than a supplier like Procter & Gamble that does one-tenth the revenue. And so all the big consumer goods companies were making a lot of the margin and the retailers weren't. So for me, there was a real problem that we could solve for retailers by delivering them basically more margin and what I see is essentially commoditized categories. And then the timing was right because we also had the rise of a new consumer that's demanding new things from brands, but more importantly, a way to reach them far more efficiently. So before, it was all traditional mass TV spend blanket approach, but now we have a highly targeted approach. So if I'm targeting a mum with a baby in nappies, that is a very specific audience I'm targeting. So if I was doing the traditional approach with national TV, maybe 90% of my spend isn't even falling on my target audience. So I can be 90% more efficient with my marketing dollars. So the rise of AI and machine learning behind ad targeting for really specific audiences and the rise of that new consumer and then the retail problems, I had this thesis that maybe we could go in and like disrupt consumer goods categories. So the first example was Rascal and Friends diapers. Um, it's now three and a half years. I think we're the third largest diaper brand in the world now. To, there's Pampers, uh, Huggies, and then Rascals. It's launched in about 36, 37 markets and we've taken significant market share in all those markets um, that we've gone into. So. So other than the ad targeting and the machine learning, what is it that has allowed you to do that? Is it doing it better? Is it branding it better? Is it something else? Well, we went and we solved the retailer's problems first in the category, yes. um, which was really important because someone like Huggies was giving, or Kimberly Clark was giving really low margin in the category, so we went and we solved that. But we you made, still need the people to buy them. A, but then we made a better product, <laughs> Yep. and we price positioned it below the market leader, and then we just serve up hundreds of millions of ads 
targeted directly towards mum. So Rascals is the most followed, most liked brand in the world on TikTok. A lot of the big companies are really slow to move onto new platforms. TikTok now people spend more time consuming more media on TikTok than any other media platform in the world. Our competitors are really, really, really slow to get there. And so we win in all of these spaces and then make a truly great product. Product is king. So we can drive someone to try it once if it's not sticky then you're mm. never going to succeed. But on the back of that, Rascals, um, yeah, has, in, in every market it's gone into, it's taken between 20 and 25% market share. So we'll ship close to 2 billion diapers this year. Wow. So from diapers, what else now is in the range we've got? The, the collagens, the supplements? Um, yeah, so the first, the first two years was like a lot of fast failing, so firing a lot of bullets and working out where we could play, what was going to be successful, what made sense from a manufacturing standpoint to go vertical to build our own factories. So, for example, Rascals, we've built a 80,000 square metre factory. It's, it's quite large. Um, and then we know that baby care is an area we want to play in. And then we've kind of condensed it now into five core verticals that we are applying in, and we're launching about 37 brands over the next three years in those categories. So pet care, baby care, personal care and beauty, uh, health and wellness, and household cleaning. Um, the next one off the rank was, was Monday, um, and Monday's ended up being a, a massive success in the US. I think seven billion media impressions, every major outlet's picked it up. Um, it'll do, this year, about $100 million at wholesale in its second year. Yeah. So that was a bullet that... It was about $150,000 investment to start Monday. Um, and by year two this year, it'll just creep over the $100 million mark at wholesale. So about $200 million at retail. Um, and again, it's scale of distribution, though. It's in 55,000 doors in the US. Um, and again, was that about providing more margin for retailers? Or was it about, like I know women who like nice hair products have always been told to buy it from the hairdresser, but now you can get this in the supermarket. Yeah, the thesis policy. there was how do we democratise Luxury. So we looked at the supermarket, we looked at every brand that was trying to scream, and we said, maybe we could whisper, we'll go really paired back in the look and aesthetic, and through that we're going to stand out. But then we positioned it. So in the US, we partner with um, Kamala Harris's niece, um, we partner with all these Monday muses, and then we partnered with Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, Vogue, and we created all of this content to position it, almost in a luxury way, mm. but then you can go into Walmart or CVS or Costco or Walgreens or Target or Ulta and buy it for 5 $6 a bottle. So it was almost that unexpected, the way we positioned it versus the way it turned up in market, and it just like, um, took off from there. Can you give us any hints as to what else is on the hit list? Uh, I think we're launching like... 12 different brands in, in personal care. So we've built a lab in Shanghai. We've hired a lot of people out of L'Oreal. Um, so about 17 formulation specialists. And then we're building, we love that. And then we're just, we're, we're just about to finish our personal care factory. So we've built a state-of-the-art, um, fully automated personal care factory. So that's coming. And then, um, yeah, across the other areas, there's um, same in pet food. We're launching about 10 different pet food brands in the next two years. That answers part of the question about how you find great people. You just poach them from other companies. <laughs> well, both. So we have like a two-tiered strategy. So our head office is Shenzhen. We have about 1,500 people there. And we interview on a weekly basis between 500 and 1,000 people. But of those people, we have a huge auditorium in our office just for the hiring process. So we either recruit. When we recruit, we steal from companies. Or we go into the best universities and try and get the best grads. So we will, uh, on the grad side, we'll go to the best universities, try and get the very, very best students, and then of that 500 to 1,000 that we'll interview, we'll hire maybe three or four. So we're super picky um, on the people that we, we bring onto the team. Um, but that talent density piece is, is really important. Can we talk about Zuru Tech now? Because I feel like this has the potential to change the world, <laughs> which I don't think is, is overstating it. Tell us about what it is, for those who haven't heard of it yet. Yeah, sure. So um, Zero Tech is something my brother um, has been doing for the last maybe decade or so now. Um, it's getting very close. And so I guess the thesis um, was that it's very expensive to build. The world's been building the same way for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if we sit here in 20 years' time, are we going to be building the same way today um, as you know, in, in, in the future? And our answer to that is, is no. Um, we're not. It's incredibly inefficient um, from start to finish, so how do we make that more efficient? So the challenge really is one of the biggest problems you can solve. If you look at the world's GDP, construction, property, property development is the largest segment of the GDP, and it's expensive, right, for what is effectively a few materials um, um, uh, as well. So it's almost like this misconception with what it costs versus what it actually should cost. 
So the idea was how do you create mass, automa autom uh, mass automation but with mass customization? So that's the problem. It's never been done before. If you're producing the same thing over and over and over again, it's quite easy to automate something complex with lots of parts. For example, that Xshot dart blaster in front of you is made with no people. It's made from a plastic granule finished production with no people in that production process. That's easy to set up production and automation for. Very difficult when people are designing their own house or their own building and you're producing that in an automated way with no people and it's completely customized. Buildings do lend themselves to mass automation and mass customization though because they are again only a few materials. So it's a problem that is solvable. And so over the last 10 years, we have about 500 people now on the project. We're aiming to get to about 2,000 in the next sort of 36 months. Um, so we have two big offices in India, Ahmedabad um, and Kolkata, uh, one big office in Milan, and they are all software driven. So if you get a chance, you can go to zurutech.com, you can see all the software. It's built on a gaming engine. Um, it's incredibly intuitive. Um, so you can design your house uh, and go through it in real time. You can stage furniture. Um, you can stage art, you can go on and eventually you'll be able to type in two-bedroom house and look at a million different two-bedroom houses that have been designed on the platform from people all around the world. And then from there, the factory builds it completely. Um, everything's finished on production lines, um, from finishes to fittings all the way through. It ships and then it's assembled on site. So um, there are 16 modules um, uh, within the building project and every single one of them we have completely innovated from start to finish. I think we have over 1,200 patent claims. Uh, is anyone else's mind blown? I feel like it's Pinterest on steroids, but you can actually just click the house and add it to cart, you know? <laughs> I was showing Nadine earlier, the software, yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's amazing because it creates a digital twin. You design your house, it creates a digital twin, which is then translated into the factory, um, and then it builds that digital twin, and it builds all the parts as a digital twin. And then and they no ship. Sh no shortage of jib. No shortage of jib. <laughs> exactly. Um, how, how close are we to that being a reality? So it's been, there's so many challenges with it. So originally, Matt and the guys were building these machines that were hundreds of meters long, and then they wouldn't work, and that scrapped them. So then what they did, sort of probably starting five years ago, they built a full mini factory. And this factory I was showing a video to also, um, basically makes a house in one-fifth scale. So whatever you put in the software, it builds that house in one-fifth scale. We've now scaled that production line up. It's about, uh, I think, four and a half hectares is the factory for one, one production line. Um, and if you go to Zuru Tech, you can see the full-size factory we're building, um, which will be one of the world's largest. It'll be two kilometers by 800 meters across. But the scaling production, the hardest part is that first production line. That's super, super, super difficult. Um, same for Tesla, same for anyone. Actually replicating it becomes the, the easy part and scaling it. So we should hopefully, um, by some time in the first six months of next year, be building full-size test houses, um, but probably from commercializing it, probably two, two years away, two to three years. And what could it actually do for a consumer who's spending, I don't know, a million dollars building a house? <laughs> What could it do to the price? Uh, imagine we're taking materials from the ground and producing them, and the only cost is the energy to get there. So we'll be able to build for less than 10% of what you can build for today, um, and we can already see that in all our bombs, all our BOMs. And so, yeah, we want to completely disrupt how you build a building from... from what's a BOM? Bill of materials. So what's our, like, cost of materials, energy, all the way through to finished product. Okay. So that could change the game. It should do. It's just there's a lot of problems to solve, as Matt will say. There's just like endless, endless, endless problems. But some of the things they're doing, I wish we had a video to show you, but some of the things they're doing are amazing. So like the tile module, you can scan any material into the computer and it makes the, ti it makes the tile and then it prints on that tile. So if I scanned a bit of wooden, it prints the wood and the texture and the grain, emboss, deboss. It looks exactly like a piece of wood. If I scan marble in, it makes the tile and marble. And our tile team is leading the world in, in, that, te in that technology. And it's really, really, um, I think I was showing you a couple of examples. It's really incredible um, what they're doing. What about regulations? Because every council in every city probably in the world has a different set of them as to what a house has to fulfill when it's built. How do you get around that? Yeah, so the team in India are basically, there's a, there's a crack team there that are cataloging every single building code in the world, in every town and every city. 
think of it like Google Maps, right? They had to map every town. Um, and then it'll all be done on the software. So the software, basically, you put your location, it looks at the soil, the geotech, it does everything um, there in the software. So to every building code in the world is the plan. What do you do to relax when you're not... Um, do you do anything to relax? <laughs> Occasionally. I play golf. Golf. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. How does the dynamic work with you and your brother? Like, what are, you, what are the each strengths that you bring to the table? Very different. He would never be sitting here doing this. Well, because we don't much. hear much from him, so <laughs> I figured that there were some differences yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. No, he's a, he's a um, his brain is different. Like, he's a genius. Like, he's got, I, the nearest thing is he's got a brain kind of like, maybe like Elon Musk, right? He can, his engineering brain to solve problems, to think through things. Also very good macro through to micro. So has a really great macro understanding of problems and then can have that access down to micro to solve those problems. So I think like that's a like yeah, that's that's his kind of strengths and I just talk a lot, you know. I think they might undersell it just a tiny bit. <laughs> How are we going for time? Anyone tell me? We're okay? Oh, okay. I think we're almost out of time. We had a few questions that had been supplied by the audience and I'd then like to offer you the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Don't make them too curly. I've just been pestering. You made them curly. For, for the best part, better part of an hour. Um, the questions from the audience. Many plastic toys go to landfill. What is Zuru doing to reduce its environmental impact? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there's two parts to that. Obviously, within our core product lines, we're doing a lot of things. So for example, a bunch of balloons now, all the balloons we switched to biodegradable two years ago, all the plastic in them is post-consumer recycled plastic now, so it's all um, recycled. We work TerraCycle on upcycling a lot of products. But like the, yeah, I, I always think that the wider problem is not necessarily plastic itself. Um, it's how we probably deal with plastic. And the only way to solve that is at a macro level. Mm. And so you have to We'll first work out what is the problem, and then if you look at landfill, I think 60-70% of the plastic that goes into landfill is packaging, so things like bottles, um, that's like a large proportion of it. And so then you have to think, how do we deal with that? Well, you have to like, at a macro level, look at the problem and make a framework that balances the economics to actually create a loop. And so right now, virgin plastic is far cheaper than post-consumer recycled plastic. So, you know, at the end of the day, like doing things like looking at countries around the world that are putting this in place, Scandinavia, France, a virgin plastic packaging tax, it makes virgin plastic more expensive, which balances out post-consumer plastic prices. It disincentivizes the consumer to buy those virgin plastic ones, doing things like tax breaks for recycling centers. You kind of have to create the economics so it can be a 360 degree loop, which New Zealand doesn't. There's no point individuals or companies trying to solve the problem because at the end of the day, the consumer always votes for price. You might not think they do, but they do, because even if I look at brands that have failed for us, we launched Me Femcare, and it has no plastic in the packaging, biodegradable wrap, organic cotton, like we did the full suite, right? And it was a massive failure, because it's 20% more expensive than some of the big brands, and we literally took like half a percent market share. And so whilst everyone says they vote, for something that's more sustainable, often they don't. So the only way to solve the problem is that creating the right framework to make recycling happen. And even looking at things like aluminium can be recycled again and again and again and again, right? Whereas plastic can't. And so again, at a government level, it's how do you change plastic bottles, which are one of the main culprits to more aluminium, and then set up the infrastructure and the tax incentives and the you know, um, incentives to make that work, is my answer. You need Long to answer. Pen a letter to the government. Um, in a world of technology and children playing more and more um, inside behind closed doors, how does Zero stay on top of trends that drag children outdoors? Do you mm. focus on that? Even just that piece about staying on top of trends, um, um, I always think, you know, we're always looking for insights relentlessly. So I always think I'm kind of this conduit that I'm getting lots of feedback from customers. I'm looking at lots of data all the time, like retail sales data, and we have a whole data and analytics team constantly tracking trends. And then we're looking at trends on YouTube and on digital world and on TikTok, and we kind of pull all that stuff together. And then we try and like work out the direction of where we're going with all of our brands based on trends. From an outdoor perspective, traditional toys aren't going anywhere. The market was up 
and this was mainly due to stimulus and tailwinds and kids being locked at home, but the market was up 30% last year. It's up about 1% this year, but it's getting a lot tougher. Consumer demand is coming off as stimulus comes off, and obviously with inflation. But it's surprising, right? Like traditional toys, it's always been this thing in toys for 20 years. Oh, tech's going to take over, tech's going to take over, but it never does. They're basically recession-proof. Um, so... Well, given where we might be heading over the coming year, it's good to hear. Right? Yeah. It's good for the business. Um, who out there would like to ask Nick a question? We've got some mics, I think, roving the room. Uh, we might have stunned you all into silence, because if you're anything like me, my mind's blown. Anybody? Yes, down the front. Hi, Nick. Uh, with your operation mostly out of China, are you worried about President Xi and his move on Taiwan, particularly as he's a good friend with Putin? That's about as curly as they come. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, think, I think for us, we're not so worried. We are looking at alternative manufacturing in terms of moving some things to Vietnam. But if you look at just toys, for example, 95% of the toys are made in China. And I think everything's too intertwined globally from a supply perspective for, for that to be a worry for us. I think I was looking at Australia. They're relying on China for over 4,000 categories of goods, total categories. So I don't see globalization changing from a trade point of view. I mean, I, they're, they're, I mean obviously, obviously there are, there are going to be this sort of a shifting world power from, from America to China, and that's going to come with its challenges, and there are tariff pressures as well. But China is just leading the world. It's so much more efficient, so much better at making anything that we see on balance, that for us, China is um, the best place to be. Um, it's hard to imagine that Shenzhen, uh, more engineers graduate from Shenzhen a year than you know, the whole of America, right? So we're just one city in China. So they're kind of unstoppable. I think Elon Musk said, right, that um, Chinese don't just burn the midnight oil, they burn the 3 a.m. oil. And in America, no one wants to turn up to work. So you've definitely got this changing, uh, this shifting power, but it's amazing what you can build and do in China and just how smart and talented everyone is. Um, at a political level, I think there's always going to be this, um, this, this, this tension, I guess, as well. Any other questions? I can't see everybody behind the pillars. Yes. Hi, um, Nick. Thank you so much for sharing. My name is Sierra. I'm a regional from China. And um, I'm in UK now. But um, just want to uh, follow up with the question. That was a brilliant question, the previous one. But I'm just thinking, what is your tips in um, the area of uh, handling the cultural differences, especially the people element part, um, the cultural differences in managing people in China uh, versus managing people in New Zealand? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, we, we found that like China, because um, we were there for 16 or 17 years and we built kind of our own culture, but the Chinese are incredible, like incredible, like unbeatable everything. Um, just their work ethic, how smart. I, I kind of equate it to the, and the story of like Japan used to make all of the world's products and then it became leading in terms of innovation. China's very much the same, right? Across tech, um, across so many areas, they are leading. And if you look at our building project, what we're building there with Chinese engineering talent, my brother will say um, our engineering talent anywhere else in the world doesn't hold a candle to the people we have in China, just the level of talent. And we are going into like the top 1% of universities and then trying to take the top 1% of that talent, but it's such a big pool. And so, yeah, and then in New Zealand, it's, it's, it's definitely more challenging um, to manage um, and in all other countries, to be honest. I feel like the Chinese just want to, uh, they're very, very, very driven to succeed and the talent pool is huge. Any other questions? We might have time for one more. Oh, down the back. <laughs> That's funny. Um, he said, any progress with the shipping line? Because um, there was a period when we, yeah, because shipping is crazy, as you guys know. I think shipping lines globally last year made $120 billion in excess profits compared to previous years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's a problem for everyone and inflation. 
Um, no, we actually, we did look, we were looking at ships and trying to buy a ship, and then even the price to try and buy a container, we even looked at trying to build our own containers, because the price of buying a container went from just the raw container from like $700 to $17,000 for the container. So the whole market just went crazy and it was hard to buy a ship. So no, we didn't end up buying ships in the end, or a ship. We were looking to experiment with it. I th think that was our final question. Um, I just have one final question on behalf of a friend, or rather 400 of my closest friends. What does it take to get invited to the party of the year at the Coatesville <laughs> Mansion? <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't do the invites. I don't think I get any invitations. <laughs> Jamie gets them all. Um, yeah, that actually, this year, circus theme. Ooh. You have to send me a note. <laughs> all right. Keeps getting bigger every year. I think last year was 1,000. I don't know what this year is going to be. Right, you're um, going to have everyone night. sliding into your DMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it has been a privilege to talk to you. You're so fascinating, and you're doing such interesting things. So thank you so much for sharing some of those insights with the audience today. Please put your hands Thanks together for that.